знаете, что Москва город Петровый для перемещения проездного. Мы э, начнем нашу работу и э, по мере все остальные принимающие присоединяются. Уважаемые дорогие коллеги, друзья,
Мы с удовольствием будем участвовать в этой конференции. И, конечно, хотелось бы пожелать участникам конференции обогатить свои знания, с одной стороны, с другой стороны, поделиться своими знаниями с коллегами. Действительно, шестая уже конференция, шестая международная конференция. Это уже стало традицией, и очень хорошей традицией на факультете иностранных языков. Я думаю, что все выступления будут очень интересны, потому что я попросила мой комитет присылать программу конференции заранее, чтобы посмотреть на тематику докладов, которые будут сделаны на этой конференции. Действительно, тематика разнообразнейшая, очень интересная. География участников тоже огромная, и это тоже свидетельствует о авторитете и значении этой конференции. Хочу пожелать вам всех, всех успехов и новых знаний. Спасибо большое.
Hello. Hi, Mike. This is Anna Nazarenka. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? Yes, and that, uh, more than that, I can see you now, even. And all our participants in the conference can see you too. Uh, Mike, we are a bit ahead of time. Is it okay with you? Because your um, time was indicated as 10.30. Can you start now? Uh, yes, you will have to just give me uh, a minute to get ready, but then, yes, it should be possible to start um, just now. Okay, um, sure. Okay, so I'm delighted to be able to um, give a presentation to the conference. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Um, yeah. Yes. Yes, I can, uh, and it's good to be able to see the people at the conference. Um, so, uh, let me, uh, what I haven't quite got ready is getting the, the PowerPoint presentation. Now, I need to switch over um, to the PowerPoint presentation into a screen share, and that will just take a second to do. Um, I expect it to take uh, a little more time to be able to do that. So, we can just see how I can do that. I know, I know how I do what you need to do. Okay, I'm just trying to do this now. Um, uh, there seems to be the problem with um, sharing screen. Uh, Did you see share screens? Uh, So I think there is a problem with sharing my screen at the moment. Um, we had tested this before and it was working okay. Um, you see? Um, I think we may have to... Um, Supported open learning, 
where the students learn online, but they get the support of local lecturers, local tutors. So all students have uh, a small group where they have the support of uh, an associate lecturer to work with them. So it's a modern approach to distance education. So that's the background from where I work. And I'm going to be talking about pedagogy. And just to be clear um, what I mean by pedagogy, um, pedagogy in our definition is the theory and practice of teaching, learning, and assessment. So uh, it's everything to do with how you teach, how students learn, and how they're assessed. And the reason for writing this report, or these series of reports, were that there have been major previous reports, uh, particularly one called the Horizon Report, which has been produced by a number of scholars in the United States and the United Kingdom and other countries, about the influence of technology on teaching. But there was nothing similar about the influence of pedagogy on uh, the student experience. And so we wanted to focus on what are the innovations in teaching and learning assessment that are going to be important in the near future. And so for each report, we chose 10 innovations uh, and described them in more detail, um, saying what they were and what their impact was likely to be in the short term and the longer term. Um, and what I want to do very briefly with you is uh, to pick out just a few of those innovations that we identified. We now have identified uh, and discussed uh, over 20 of them, and we're just producing this year's report with further innovations. So I want to pick out one or two of them. Um, so this is the reports, they're all available online, and I will give you the, uh, the URL, the link at the end. So it's an annual report that explores new forms of teaching, learning, and assessment for an interactive world. And the aim is to guide teachers and policy makers in productive innovation, both at an uh, institutional level, to try and make institutions, universities more innovative, but also at a practical, individual level, how to improve your methods of teaching, learning, support, and assessment. So the first one I want to cover is Massive Open Online Courses. And some, many of you, I think, will be familiar with the term MOOC, or Massive Open Online Courses. Is that right? Um, are most of the people in the audience familiar with the term MOOC? Yes, yes. OK, good. Um, when we wrote our first report uh, in 2012, it was still very much at the early stages where um, a number of uh, universities such as Stanford and MIT were experimenting with this new approach of making their learning available for free. At the Open University um, in 2012, we also created an online platform called FutureLearn, um, which now has um, uh, over 30 partners, uh, uh, over 100 courses, over 300,000 learners. Um, and the uh, picture that you can see here is of one course on corpus linguistics. So the, uh, I know that the audience has uh, an interest in the background in language and linguistics. So FutureLearn, like um, some of the other MOOC providers, offers free online courses in areas of linguistics uh, and language learning, ranging from introductory language learning up to uh, advanced linguistics. So this is part of a course on corpus linguistics. Um, and just one, we call it steps, one element in that course with a video and some text. Very similar to other um, MOOC uh, providers, but one of the things that we have attempted to do with FutureLearn um, that I think is part of the future development of massive open online courses 
is to bring in social learning. So to base it on a social constructivist approach to learning, um, not just a transmission instructivist. So every piece of content has associated with it uh, a discussion uh, where the learners can engage in discussion with each other about a particular piece of content, in this case that video. And there are very rich um, and engaging um, discussions uh, expanding on the content. You can see here uh, on the right hand side um, a discussion about um, the glossary definition of collocation and um, the person who's writing this, one of the learners, saying that the definition uh, is not one that he can understand, um, trying to understand it, and other learners coming back with responses as to how to help that learner understand the definition of collocation. Um, one of the people who responds is the lecturer, the educator, and there's a rich discussion. Now, that's just one part of hundreds of discussion content elements provided by the learners. And what's happened is that you not only have the transmission of information through these massive online courses, but because you have the large scale, because you have 10 or 20,000 learners engaging with each course, then the contributions that they make become a rich resource for other learners and making it easy to add those conversations, to link them into the content material means that it enhances each element of the course. Another example here that I'm sharing again for future learn is how we can uh, harness, how we can exploit the advantages of massive scale for peer review. So one of the problems with massive open online courses is that you can't have the intensive tutoring in the way that we do for our paid courses at the Open University. So you have to find other ways of enabling effective peer support uh, and peer tutoring. And in this case, um, we've done it through peer review. In peer review, um, you, and you can see this on the left hand side, um, it's from a course on Shakespeare and Shakespeare's Hamlet. Um, so the British playwright William Shakespeare, um, he's playing Hamlet. The course was about understanding Hamlet uh, and uh, engaging in a critical review of the play Hamlet. This peer review was about um, asking learners to decide which version of the play, uh, because there were a number of versions that were written by Shakespeare, which version of the play they preferred. They were set an assignment with a structured rubric, a structured way to address that question. When a learner submitted the assignment, it then went into a pool, and from that pool, they could then um, get another person's assignment to read and to comment on. Um, and again, they used a structured format to produce a comment and helpful critique. Meanwhile, somebody else was reviewing their assignment, uh, and again, in a structured format, and within usually two hours, you will get the first reviews back. And you can review as many assignments as you want to, and the more reviews you make, the more reviews you get back. It's a constructive process of engaging in peer review and discussion with other learners around an assignment. Um, it's something that the larger the scale, the more people who are involved, the more effective it is. Um, and one of the things we want to do with MOOCs as a new pedagogy is to explore how we can use the massive scale to make certain forms of learning more effective, in this case peer review and also online discussions. So that's one example of a new pedagogy around massive open online courses. The next example I want to give of a new pedagogy is a pedagogy for ebooks. And again, I'm sure you will be 
familiar with e-books and online books. Um, and the new opportunity is firstly to make those books more interactive, um, to have them adaptive and dynamic, to be able to put uh, illustrations, um, to be able to have automatic updating of material in the books, so that if it was a, a book, say, about economics, you could have latest economic information, um, latest um, figures from um, the uh, economic indicators included in the book. But just like MOOCs um, are becoming more social and more socially engaged, so can e-books. Um, already on e-books from um, Kindle and uh, other providers, you can see annotations and comments from other readers. Um, and in the future, there will be opportunities to create um, ways in which other readers can not only annotate, but for instance, author elements of the book. So that you can have, um, just as we saw with the MOOCs, the comments from uh, the other learners with ebook, you can uh, see in the future the possibility for readers to be able to provide comments, to provide annotations, which then other readers can switch on so that they can read how the other people who are reading that book uh, are engaging with it, what comments they're making. So that you get a notion of crowd authoring, many people helping to author and to extend the book, uh, and reading together, the idea of co-reading. Uh, in the UK, and it may well be in Russia, that you have book clubs where people read books together. Um, so the opportunity to have an online book club where you have a group of people who are reading a book together and sharing their comments, their annotations. So social reading is uh, suggested the next phase of the e-book revolution. Um, and to give you an example of uh, something that uh, we did a similar, it was a project with a company called Sharp. They manufacture um, screens, they manufacture handheld devices, they're a Japanese company. And what they were interested in is how can you enable people to learn a foreign language in the context of reading from books, particularly learning of vocabulary and incidental learning of vocabulary. So rather than teaching vocabulary elements, enabling somebody who is reading an e-book in a foreign language to learn vocabulary in the context of reading that book. That fits into the gaps of everyday life and is also adaptive so that each time you read a book it's appropriate to you and the vocabulary is appropriate to you as a reader. And to bring in aspects of games, so uh, an e-game as well as an e-book. So the idea is that you are reading an e-book um, for pleasure, for enjoyment, but also, since it's in a foreign language, for vocabulary as well, to extend your vocabulary. As you're reading the book, either the book selects for you, or you can select yourself words that you want to know more about. So you have a personal vocabulary. Um, you can rehearse that vocabulary list. You can ask for definitions of the words, of the words used in context. You can see concordances. But also, um, you can use those words then to play games. Um, so you can extend your understanding of vocabulary by playing games around it. For example, you can practice sentence construction with an online game from the words that you have read in the book. And as you play that game using the words from the book, there may be missing words as you play the game, words that you don't understand in playing the game, so you go back to the e-book to try and find those words and those words used in context. So the idea is that you have an e-book and an e-game, both of which are helping you to extend your vocabulary. Now I'm just going to show you an example of one for younger children. Um, this is it here. It's one that we developed with Sharp Labs and also Oxford University Press. Um, 
It's based on an Oxford University Press book for younger readers who are learning English. So you have um, on the left hand side the story, uh, the book can read you the story, um, but also it can indicate certain words um, that the, it thinks is at your vocabulary level, or you can select those words yourself, uh, and you can get uh, a dictionary definition of those words. But also, um, you can start to play a game, and this is the game, the game is for younger children. Uh, on the left hand side, you see the words that you have collected from the book, um, and those words help you to play a game that's associated with the characters in the book. In this case, there's a dog, which is one of the characters in the book, and uh, part of the story in the book is about uh, trying to find songs, um, trying to find, uh, it's uh, somebody who wants to be a musician, wants to be a pop star, and, and has to get songs. So that's the challenge, and to do that, you have to uh, get the dog to find the songs. So at the bottom of the screen is open the blank, and you then have to use one of the words that you found in the book to uh, continue that, in this case, open the window. And so you go on, you go on playing the game using the vocabulary of the book. Um, and when you, uh, is a word that you want to use but you can't, uh, haven't yet read in the book, one of the ones in grey on the left side, you then have to go back to the book to find more. So you're going between the book and the game, both of which are helping you to learn language. Uh, and Sharp uh, developed this uh, e-book and game um, for Android computers. Uh, it's now on sale in Japan. Uh, and you can see on the left-hand side um, one of the stories. In this case, um, it's a story from Sherlock Holmes. Um, and the vocabulary elements. And then there is the games that you can play with that book. Uh, and also on the right hand side, you can get indicators, um, analytics, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute, visualizations of how your learning is going, how many words you've read, the effort that you're putting in to play that game. So there's a new pedagogy around ebooks where you can bring together elements of games uh, and also elements of language learning um, in association with ebooks and ebook reading. The next piece of pedagogy I want to talk about, the next pedagogy innovation, is seamless learning. And as you'll see, all of these different pedagogies fit together. So, um, where I was talking about ebooks and about fit <coughs> day life. Learning fitting into your everyday life. So seamless learning is about connecting learning experiences across locations, time, technology, or social settings. So as people have mobile technologies, like e-book readers, like mobile phones, they are enabling, allowing learning to continue across different contexts. You can start a piece of learning in the classroom and then continue it at home, you can have ideas that come to you when you are on the move, and then you can share them with colleagues online, then you can meet up with that person. So there is a continuity, a fluid movement of learning across locations and technologies and engagement with other people. Uh, and that's the notion of seamless learning. And there is research being carried out uh, in Singapore, for example, uh, in Taiwan, uh, in Europe, on this notion of connecting learning experiences between formal and informal settings. And one key challenge for that is if there is this continual flow of learning across times, across locations, how can we enable learners to, to pause, to stop for a little bit, and to be able to reflect, to think about the learning that they're doing? How can we create teachable moments 
where the learner stops for a time, maybe discussions with other people. How can we create these teachable moments from this technology supported flow of experience? So that's the central issue of seamless learning. Um, and I want to give you an example of that from another project that I'm involved in. This is a project uh, with the Swiss government, with Switzerland. And they have, um, like many countries, uh, a vocational education system where they put a great deal of effort into enabling people um, who don't want to be academics, but who want to have a vocational, a work-based learning experience um, to engage not only in learning in the workplace, but also learning in a college or a classroom. And the big problem is how do you connect those two? How do you connect the learning that goes on in the workplace and the learning that goes on in the classroom? And they have developed a model here uh, of that learning process where you collect um, ideas, you collect evidence, you collect instances of learning in the workplace, which you then prepare in the classroom, and then you share with other learners, with, with a teacher, and then you take that back into the workplace to validate it, um, to extend it. And I'll just give you some examples of that. One example is about dental assistants, so dentists' assistants who, in the workplace, um, capture examples of problems that they have in the workplace. In this case, because they're dentist assistants, problems with teeth. And they use uh, images uh, on mobile phones to capture issues or problems in the workplace. They then select those pictures and prepare a, a, an online page, which they then share with their classroom to discuss that problem in the class, and then they take back into the workplace the solutions to those problems. Another example, <coughs> very similar, is car mechanics. People who are working in a car, garage, or in a factory with a head-mounted display, a camera on their head, where they can take very short video sequences, which they then edit and um, add their text about what went wrong, what was the problem, so a critical incident, a problem in the workplace which they then discuss in the classroom with their peers, with their colleagues, and then they take back into the workplace to then uh, try and talk with their supervisor about how you solve those problems. So that's seamless learning, about connecting learning in the workplace and learning in the classroom and back into the workplace. The last element, and because I can't cover all 20, the last one I want to mention is about learning analytics. And learning analytics is underpinning a lot of the innovations that are happening in teaching, learning, and assessment. Um, I showed you that ebook earlier on and the design from Sharp where, as a learner, you can see a graph of your vocabulary level and how your vocabulary is increasing uh, and the effort that you put in. That's an example of providing analytics back to the learner. But there are also opportunities to provide analytics back to the teacher um, or to the administrator about how the learning is progressing to enable them to um, develop more effective ways of teaching and learning. So what we really want is a circle where the analytics, where the data from how people learn, then becomes a visual resource for the teacher or for the administrator, which then helps them to design more effective teaching and learning, which then creates new learning activities, which then results in more data. And the really exciting possibility is that because we now have a large scale and online learning, and also learning that's seamless, we can capture a lot richer analytics of learning. We can capture the learning from very many people, so we can do experiments online where people do one course or a similar course, and in real time we can capture how they're learning, but also capture how people are learning outdoors, indoors, so in different settings. And I want to give you some
um, very quick examples of how learning analytics is really changing the way in which we understand how people learn. So to go back to the peer review that I mentioned, where you submit an assignment, um, then somebody reviews your assignment, and you also get a review back from another learner. So in FutureLearn, every day we get analytics back, and we share those with the universities that are putting on the courses. So this is an example of the kind of top level, the highest level analytics we get back. So from our first eight courses for peer review, we had 6,000 submissions, 10,000 reviews, uh, and for each learner, on average, they got back uh, between uh, one to two reviews on their assignment. Now on average, they're getting back two reviews per assignment. The average length of the review was 300 words, which is good because we set 300 words as the, uh, as the limit for the uh, assignments. The average length of the review, 80 words. We found that a third of the people who were taking part in the course engaged in this peer review. And most important, it took three hours on average from submitting your assignment to getting your first review back. So that's the top level statistics, analytics you can get back. But then if you go a little bit deeper, uh, this is an example of what the next level might look like. Um, so these here are all of the assignments on one course. And what it shows along the bottom is the time between writing or first seeing your assignment and um, then uh, getting, uh, submitting that assignment. So the time that each learner takes from first seeing the assignment to handing it in, to submitting it online. On the left hand side, up the uh, other axis, you see the number of words. Now you would expect that the longer it takes somebody to write an assignment, the more words they would write. Which you can see, you can see a trend of the longer the more minutes, the more words. But there's some strange things. For example, if you look right at the left hand side, you will see an assignment that was a thousand words, but took less than a minute. So what was happening there? Why? How could somebody submit an assignment that was a thousand words, but took less than a minute to write? And the answer was that they were copying. That they had just copied the words from another place and pasted them in. As uh, if you look down at the bottom left, then you see some assignments that are very, very short and take no time to write. And those are people who are just writing rubbish. So what you want is to firstly not send out the assignments of the rubbish to be reviewed and also to pick up the people who are copying um, and um, give them some extra guidance that they should be writing their own assignment, not just copying and pasting. So we can look for patterns in the data to help us um, both make the process more efficient, but also to give guidance to individual learners as to how they may be more effective or to stop them copying. Um, so we can do more detailed analysis. Um, so, uh, another example is that um, on the MOOC platform, uh, we have videos. And one of the questions we wanted to ask was, how long should a video be? Uh, how long is it before, if you're watching a video, you get bored? Well, we know exactly the answer to that now, because we have tens of thousands of people who have been watching the videos on a platform, and we know exactly when they quit, when they uh, not just finish watching the video, but quit from the course altogether. And the answer is 10 minutes. That um, under 10 minutes, people generally engage with watching the video. If the video is longer than 10 minutes, you get a very rapid drop off of people leaving the course. So we know lots of things now about the details of how people learn, but also the bigger picture of how people learn. And we're using this information to improve the quality of the teaching and learning. So it's a very exciting time where 
we had massive scale experiments with teaching and learning. We have new pedagogies such as seamless learning and learning from e-books. And there is a real opportunity for people with language skills to be able to do some of this analysis and to engage in some of these new teaching practices. For example, because we get all of the comments back from the learners, we can do analysis of the text of the comments and of the discourse of the comments. For example, looking at sentiment analysis of whether the comments are positive and negative, about the progression of the dialogue, we have very rich data now to understand the language aspects of how people are learning. So I want to finish up now um, and to say that at the moment we are looking not just at new technologies for learning, but new pedagogies, new ways of teaching, learning and assessment that can really guide innovation for the future. So while the technologies and the policies may change, good pedagogy is absolutely central to the future of learning and good pedagogy endures. The URL for our reports is down below. It's www.open.ac.uk slash innovative. All the reports are free uh, and you, if you go to that site you'll be able to get access to them. I hope I've given you some short examples of innovations in pedagogy and some inspiration as to how these may be used in your own teaching and learning. Thank you. Mike, thank you very, very much. It was really enjoyable, um, very useful and very educational. And who knows, probably we might think about starting um, open courses, massive open courses, and then we will need your uh, coaching, your instructions on the new pedagogy. Thank you very much. And that's when we can see you in person here. Bye bye. Thank you. Goodbye and thank you. And I wish you all the best for your progress. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Дорогие коллеги, мы продолжаем. И слово предоставляется профессору Владимиру Васильевичу Варламову из Института ядерной физики Московского университета. Его доклад будет носить очень широкий и для нас очень важный характер. Это философские вопросы информатизации образования. Я не 
мы физики, мы немножко физики, мы и немножко лингвистики тоже. Я, правда, сам предпочитаю использовать термин не философские проблемы, не философские вопросы, а вообще физические. Этому есть простое, простое объяснение. На заре развития науки и образования в первых университетах все проблемы и общества, и природы окружающего нас мира изучались на факультетах филологических. Физических тогда просто, просто не было. Так вот, что общего между информатной лингвистикой и ядерной физикой с философской точки зрения? Это прежде всего понятие информации. Что такое информация, легко любой из нас ответит. Это сведения о предметах, явлениях, окружающих нас действительности. Но на самом деле все не так просто. Ну вот, предположим, что-то происходит в нашей жизни. Какое-нибудь событие, например, трагическое, о которых так любят писать средства нашей массовой информации, какая-нибудь катастрофа, есть пострадавшие. И, скажем, три информационных агентства дают сведения об этом событии, приводя число пострадавших. Очень часто все три агентства дают три разных числа. С научной точки зрения это означает, что либо два из них, либо все три вместо информации дают дезинформацию. Или, например, какая-нибудь газета публикует сведения о том, что некто, имя река какой-то, вор коррупционера обокрал государство на огромную сумму денег. Через некоторое время суд его оправдывает. Так что было опубликовано в газете? Получается, что опять дезинформация. На бытовом уровне очень часто мы считаем, что информация – это правдивые сведения о событиях, явлениях, предметах окружающей действительности. То есть это правда о том, что есть вопрос вокруг нас и что вокруг нас происходит. На примере известного анекдота советских времен легко показать, что и здесь не все так просто. То есть анекдот был такой. Престарелый генеральный секретарь ЦК КПС Никита Сергеевич вызвал бежать на передонки молодого президента США Джона Кеппа. Ну, о результате, который мы себе легко можем представить, средства массовой информации США сообщили. Кеннеди пришел первым, Хрущев последним. И это была правда. Но советские средства массовой информации в том же результате сообщили по-другому. Хрущев пришел вторым, а Кеннеди предпоследним. И это тоже была правда. То есть получается, что правда две, а информация с научной точки зрения должна быть одна. То есть каждый из таких, из таких прав чего-то не хватало для того, чтобы быть информацией. Но в данном простом конкретном случае не хватало именно конкрет, конкретного сообщения о том, что бежали два человека. Бывает, то есть мы должны признать, что не просто сведения о событиях, явлениях и предметах являются информацией, а наиболее полные, наиболее точные и, самое главное, наиболее достоверные средства мы должны всегда иметь в виду, когда говорим о философском содержании слова информации. И если о полноте и точности любой из нас тоже может судить достаточно просто, то с понятием достоверности все снова с философской точки зрения оказывается гораздо сложнее. Я обучение своих студентов информационных технологий в области ядерной физики всегда начинаю с примера, который получил название «два термометра». Суть его в следующем. Вот, предположим, мы хотим измерить температуру в данном помещении. Мы берем два термометра для частоты эксперимента разных, например, спиртовой и термопарной. Кладем их рядом и видим, что один из них показывает условия, 
условно 20 градусов, а другой условно 25. Ну, к слову сказать, в ядерной физике это довольно типичная ситуация, потому что эксперименты очень сложные, методы используются разные, измерения в основном косвенные. Так вот, <coughs> один термометр показывает 20, другой 25. Возникает вопрос, какова же достоверная температура, достоверное значение температуры в этом помещении. Ответ на этот вопрос весьма непрост. Большинство людей, которых я спрашивал об этом, легко и быстро говорят. Температура равна 22,5, ну там с определенной погрешностью, которая связана с погрешностью. То есть выдают за наиболее достоверный результат среднее арифметическое значение. Но при таком большом разбросе, который явно превышает точность приборов, совершенно очевидно, что этот разброс связан с присутствием каких-то неизвестных систематических погрешностей, и поэтому к нему нужно отнестись с большим недоверием. Ну что такое систематические погрешности? Легко проиллюстрировать их примером из известного романа «Петрофилетний капитан». Помните, там под очень точный корабельный компас положили в опор, и корабль вместо того, чтобы приплыть в Америку, приплыл в Африку. То есть, когда мы говорим о таком разбросе, превышающем намного точности приборов, мы должны поставить вопрос о том, что именно приводит к такому разбросу, что за систематические погрешности здесь присутствуют. Еще раз обращусь к тому, что выдаваемый за достоверный результат средний арифметический никоим образом таким быть не может, потому что он является самым маловероятным, то есть самым недостоверным из всех возможных она получается только в режиме тройных совпадений, вероятность которых крайне низка. Совпадений такого образа. Почему тройных? Ну, потому что среднеарифметическое в таких условиях получается только если оба термометра дают неправильные показания. Врут они на абсолютно одинаковые значения, но только в разные стороны. То есть можно с уверенностью сказать, что Достоверное значение температуры в таких условиях будет отличаться от среднего И чтобы понять, чему оно равно, нужно провести специальные, очень точные, детальные исследования, способов которых, вообще говоря, только два. Ну, первый такой, нужно поехать на заводы, где делались эти термометры, и детальнее для того, чтобы разобраться, почему у этих парк, которые нам принадлежат, Термометры показывают именно такие значения. Может выясниться много 